Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 is where we're going to be this morning. I've just got a couple minutes, and I'm going to share this with you. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. This is actually our theme verse for summer camp. And um, it's a very special verse to me personally. Let's read it together. If you read it out loud with me. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. I grew up in a godly Christian home. My sister did as well. My dad's a pastor in Yorktown, Virginia at Central Baptist Church. Um, He's been the pastor there for almost 12 years now. It's been wonderful to see how God has grown the church spiritually, um, even physically, and uh, we get to do things that most kids don't even get to do. We get to talk to missionaries more in depth because we're the pastor's kids. I've heard pastor's kids say they hate being pastor's kids. I don't really understand that. Um, To me, I think it's one of the best things you could ever do, and um, Ethan can testify to that that today, and um, some great things as being a pastor's kid, but there's also some struggles you go through as well, Um, and as I got to age about 10, um, I came to my dad, and I got to go on my knees with him, and he shared the gospel with me, and I made a profession of faith at that moment. Um, between ages 10 and 12, um, I started struggling with just a, a little bit, maybe a little bit of doubting uh, my salvation, and when I was 12 years old after a revival, I got on my knees, or I got actually on a cooler with another man at a teen activity. He shared the gospel with me. I already knew what the gospel was. I already heard it several times. And God convicted my heart, and I got it settled that day. Praise the Lord. Um, It went on, and right after that, don't you just love it how you move forward spiritually, and the devil tries to attack you. And you get to that one point where God's doing something special in your life, and man, you start feeling pretty good about yourself. That's a dangerous point. And I have to watch that every single day. And I got into a thing called pornography for a very long time. I'm very ashamed of that. But you know, God's not done with me. And God's not done with you. When I was 15 years old, I got into, what do you think, a prayer room. And I got with my dad and two other gentlemen in the room. And I opened up. It was my turn to give the devotional that morning. And it was just us few guys. I came to Psalm 51 with David. And I said, Dad, I I can't do this anymore. And God convicted me. And I I just poured out my heart. And you know what? I love how guys and gals are scared of their parents and what they'll think of them. My dad wrapped his arms around me. And he says, I'm here for you. I'm so glad for a godly father like that. He did that. God worked in my heart and uh, transformed my life. God called me to preach when I was 15. Um, started getting into the ministry. My dad, I don't know why he did this, but he started allowing me to lead the singing at age 17. He started allowing me to lead the, co- the choir at age 17. Started getting into where I led the soul winning program and um, started just going all out for Jesus Christ. Well, you say, Carrie, that's a great thing. Absolutely. Well, there's something that I'm still missing through all this. Like I said, I've grown up as a Christian young man. I've gone up, grown up in a, a godly home. And God's done some great things in my life. God called me to preach when I was 15 and started going all in. And for what I thought was good for Jesus Christ, that I may please him. That's what the Bible says. And so I was doing great. I was getting excited about what God was doing. And it turned out that through all of that, as I was leading the singing, as I was doing special music with my sister, as I'm preaching in nursing homes, I'm preaching in uh, older centers, I'm preaching on Sunday mornings, even sometimes for our youth Sundays, I'm getting to do Sunday school. I'm getting to do all these wonderful things. And you know what? It came down to January of 2019 where I got on my knees and I felt so empty. Because you know what? I had Jesus in my heart, but I had no idea who Jesus was. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. We've got just a few minutes, and we're going to finish out real quick, all right? Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. The Bible says that I may know him, that is Jesus Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. I got to a Christian camp. God spoke to my heart. I did not know Jesus personally. I knew him as my Savior. He lived inside of me. I had no idea what he could do through me. I had no idea what he could do in me. I had no idea who my best friend really was. And that's a very, very awesome point to be in because guess what? 
you can know. And that's a great place to be at. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him. That I may know him. I had a guy come up to me. He's a scholar. He knows Greek, Hebrew, all this stuff. He came up to me. He said, Carrie, you go to a Bible institute. They focus on soul winning there. They focus on building you as a preacher and getting to do all these great things. And you know what, Carrie? Those are good things. But you and those men over there need to know God. And I said, I said in my heart, I didn't say it out loud to him. I said, you're nuts. I said, I'm doing everything that God has called me to do. And I thought that was enough. Let me tell you, that's a lie straight out of hell. And you ought to know Jesus. God worked in my heart, and I'm so glad he did. And I started getting to know Jesus Christ. Started getting to know my God. And as I got to know him so much more personally, I realized, I'm going to tell you this statement. I don't know if I heard it from someone else, but I got it this summer, and I wrote it down. Your view of God will determine your walk with God. Your view of God will determine your walk with God. If you're getting to know your Savior personally, that I may know him, Jesus, you get to the second part of the verse. And the power of his resurrection. What kind of view of God do you have this morning? What kind of view of God do you have this morning? If it's a great view of your God, my dad likes to say this, it's like Caleb and Joshua when they went into the promised land, they looked in and they saw all the giants and just like all those other 10 gentlemen that came into that land, they looked at those 10 giants and you know what? They could have said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm good. Those guys are big. Um, I can't do that. Well, you're right. You can't do that, but God can. And so Joshua and Caleb come in there and they've got a great outlook. They've got a great view of their God. They say that those giants are big, but man, he's way bigger. And the 10 gentlemen that are with them come back. They say, man, I don't think we could do this. And you know what? God punishes them because they didn't have faith in God. They didn't know their God the way they needed to know him. And so they get to that point. Joshua and Caleb got a great view of their God. There's a question this morning, very simple, but what kind of view of God do you have this morning? Number one, that I may know him so that I may have a great view of him. And number three, the fellowship of his sufferings. Once you get to know Jesus, once you get to have a great view of your God, then God requires that you need to draw closer to him. What's sad is a lot of times he has to put us through trials in order to do that. The fellowship of his sufferings. How do you have a great view of your God? Well, to be honest with you, I heard one guy, actually, Joseph, he's here with us. His youth pastor, my old youth pastor, called, uh, called me the other week, and I was talking to him after summer camp. He said, Carrie, I've got to be honest with you. I heard this from one preacher. He said, a lot of times, a man has to be wounded greatly before he has to be used greatly. Let me say that again. You can only be wounded greatly a lot of times in order to be used greatly. And that's because we're stubborn. But I'm so glad that Jesus does it anyway. And so that I may know him, so that I may have a great view of him, so that I can get to have a personal walk with him, not myself, not just my godly friends, but with him. It's all about Jesus. It's not about us. It's all about Christ. It's all about what he did on that cross. And so when you get to know, as 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You get to know the fellowships of the sufferings of God. And once you get to know the sufferings of Jesus Christ, you get to know how wonderful, how amazing, how terrific he is personally to you and how much you can't do anything without him. It's all about him. Number one, that I may know him. Number two, to have a great view of him. Number three, to experience the fellowship of his sufferings. Number four, being made conformable unto his death. It's one of the hardest things. I think it's very amazing. And the fact that Jesus would want me to be like him. Let me ask you this. When someone looks at you, who do they see? When someone looks at me, who do they see? I've got just one verse. It's really his verse. That I may know him. I'd ask you this morning, do you know Jesus Christ? That last point, 
being made conformable unto his death, I had no idea that Jesus was shaping me into his image when I got saved. He is conforming me unto his image. When you go into a store, people ought to be able to see right through you and see Jesus. When you go into your workplace, people ought to be able to see right through you and see Jesus. All about him. I want to read something to you this morning. Hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. I got this from my dad. Um, It's written by an anonymous person. But it's called No Turning Back. And uh, it encouraged me. And it ends with a very special statement, which we'll get to in just one second. But I want to think about this this morning, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I can have a great view of him. In order to have a great view of him, a lot of times i got to get on my knees, and sometimes he has to bring us to our knees, sadly. And so you get to go through those fellowship of his sufferings. And then you get to the very end of the verse, and he says, being made conformable unto his death, Jesus died on that cross as I preached last night to the young people. He gave his all for you and for me. And he wants us to be able to be like him. Listen to this very quickly. This man or this woman, this person that wrote this said, I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back. I won't let up. I won't slow down. I won't back away or be still. My past is redeemed, praise God. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence. I no longer need prosperity. I don't need position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right. I don't have to be first. Man, I struggle with that. Tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean on his presence. I walk by patience. I live by prayer, and I labor by his power. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions few. My guide reliable, and my mission clear. I cannot be bought. I cannot deluded. I cannot be delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. I will not hesitate in the presence of adversity or or, or negotiate at the table of the enemy or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up. I won't shut up. I won't let up until I have stayed up. I have stored up. I have prayed up. I have paid up and I have preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes. I must give till I drop. I will preach till all know and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. Let me ask you this morning, can Jesus recognize you? When other people see you, do they recognize him? That I may know him. Would you bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the great day that you've given to us. God, we love you. Oh God, would you forgive me of my pride and my selfishness? Lord, we can't do anything without you. Lord, I pray for my dad as he preaches your word this morning. God, would you help every pastor in America, God, across this world, to be able to lift up the name of Jesus and to be able to back it up knowing that they can see Jesus through them only by your grace. God, I pray that you'd help us to show forth Jesus this morning. Would you help pastor this morning as he leads, as he preaches your word? God, would you use us for your honor and your glory? Lord, we can't do this without you. We leave all the results in your hands. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.